Hey, you guys. Welcome to the first national conference of the Dramatists Guild of America. We are so happy that you are here, and I know it took a lot for some of you to get here. There was bad weather in Chicago, rooms that weren't quite ready, but we're just happy that you're sitting in this house right now and so thrilled that you came to join us here in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, you know, people always remember their first, so <laughs> you have the distinguished honor to know that you are always here at the first national conference of the Drama Skill. That's a pretty cool thing. So I, I, I think we should celebrate you all in a room full of theatrical trailblazers for being first. So thank you. Thank you very much. In case you don't know, my name is Gary Garrison. I'm the Executive Director of Creative Affairs for the Dramatist Guild of America, and I will be your tour guide over the next two or three days. <clears throat> so when you see me, just know that I usually have an introduction to make or to share some information with you. Like right now, for example, between these, uh, let me give you a little piece of information. Between these sessions, between the Krista Ring session and the Molly Smith session, if you're hungry, if you want a little nosh, if you want a little something to drink, you'll have time to go back into the lobby and uh, there'll be a cash bar and there'll be some food floating around and you can have a little something so that you don't pass out in the middle of these seats. Okay. Because time is short while we're together, I'll always keep my introductions short and brief. Um, almost five years ago, when I came to the Guild, one of the things that I was charged with was helping the Guild to realize its national potential. So to that end, we've done a, a lot of different things, and I, I hope you've, uh, uh, you, you see some of that work. But prob there are two things that I'm actually the proudest of. Um, at this point, I might add. The first is that we regionalized the country. And in doing so, we came up with 22 <laughs> regional reps that represent you. 22, you guys. And that is Atlanta and Boston and Miami and Houston, and, and the list goes on and on and on and on. These are folks that are in your area to help build your communities, to listen to you, to guide you, to advise you, to help you out through programming, to offer you events ticket discounts, they report to you in the magazines. They are an extraordinary group of people that do this absolutely for free and for the love of doing it. So if you are a regional rep, would you please stand up and let us recognize you? Actually, after the Molly Smith session, we're going to have everybody out into the foyer, and I, I'm going to introduce you to them one by one so you get to see their faces. Because part of what we want you to do is we want you to talk to folks, and we want you to know who's in your area and to meet one another. The second thing that I'm particularly proud of is this national conference. It just made sense to me that we should come together as a group of people. It made sense to me that you would be under one roof talking about your hopes and your dreams, your desires, sometimes our frustrations, our war stories, looking for wisdom, looking for advice, looking for help, shaking hands, and meeting the people that you hear about, see about, talk about, one-on-one -on -one in conversation. This is a really important thing for everybody in the room. There's somebody here to inspire you, I promise you. It could be the person right next to you, or it could be a council member, it could be a publisher, it could be these glorious folks from the Theater of the First Amendment, Theater for the First Amendment, who have graciously allowed us to come into their home this weekend. <clears throat> And the great thing about the Council of the Dramatists Guild is you will find them approachable, easy to talk to, and ready to talk to you. And I just encourage you to do that. Just go up and stick your hand out. Introduce yourself and tell them who you are. If there's anything that you have to say, say it. If there's anything that you want to talk about, you come talk to me about it. You come talk to anybody who's got this little black pen on because they want to hear what you have to say. These are the regional reps the members of Theater for the First Amendment, 
These are staff of the Dramatists Guild, the glory. Talk to the staff of the Drama Skill. Talk to your regional reps. Talk to your talk, you guys. Talk. You know, writers are notorious. They love nothing better than to disappear in the dark. <laughs> so here's your chance to kind of step forward, get into the light, and talk a little bit to each other, to us, and hopefully at the end of this time together, we will all walk away enriched, inspired, happy, hot. <laughs> That's why we put those water bottles in your bags, did you notice? Those water bottles are going to come in handy, I'm telling you all that now. Anyway, I just want you to talk, and, and talk and listen. Listen to each other. Listen to what these gorgeous panelists have to say. And so with that in mind, I'd like to bring to the stage our Southwest Texas Regional Rep, Jim Price, and one of the most extraordinary men in the American theater, Christopher Durain. But that, that influenced me. But 
Uh, I, um, I grew up in New Jersey and I was lucky enough to be brought in to see musical comedies. And uh, I think the second one I saw was How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. I was like 12 or 10 or something, uh, starring the wonderful Robert Morse. And, um, and I don't know if you know that musical, but it is in kind of a, a comic, uh, a comic book sort of style of comedy. And the characters are exaggerated and, uh, and funny. And uh, I, I think, unconsciously, I, I went, oh, I like that style. Also, I, I was asked growing up sometimes, or rather in my 20s, whether I thought television influenced me. And I, I at first thought it was an annoying question. I didn't really have an answer. And I, I thought, well, we all, I was a child of the 50s and early 60s, so we all grew up with that tele particular television. But um, uh, I do think that, that the early sitcoms, uh, like I Love Lucy and which is probably the best, but other good ones too, that um, uh, they were quick paced. And I found myself, as much as I enjoy a lot of the, the plays of the 50s, I didn't, I didn't myself want to write something, I wasn't drawn to it, that was set in real time, where you're in the kitchen and you go, hi, how, how'd you sleep? Oh, I slept okay. And, what do you have for breakfast? Oh, no. And I was kind of like, get to it, get to it. Um, so anyway, so that's my answer to where I, I think it came from. And also, I don't know. I don't know what makes you though laugh. I am one of those people who laugh at not funny things. But I mean pain. I don't mean I'm sadistic. But you know, if if uh, if you watch the adults around you make the same mistake twenty times in a row, at a certain point you want to jump out the window or you laugh. And I was one of the ones who laughed. My mother actually also laughed sometimes. That was a very good sense of humor. Great. Um, so I read somewhere that you wrote your first play at age eight. Uh, what was it about? <laughs> well, I just mentioned I Love Lucy. I wrote my own version, two pages long, of the episode in which Lucy has a baby. <laughs> and I was particularly taken with the episode, and I was eight, and uh, where they practiced, uh, Desi and Ethel and Fred practiced what they would do when Lucy said it's time to go to the hospital. And of course, they practiced it beautifully, and as soon as she said it's time, they all ran into each other and blah, blah, blah. And I found that very funny as a child. And um, my mother, uh, actually both sides of my family were very open to the arts. I did not have a family that discouraged me. Uh, my mother's family had a lot of musicians. My mother loved the theater and talked to me about the theater a lot from, and read to me a lot, too. Um, my father's family was mostly architects, but back in time, they came from actors in the 1700s. There's a book in some libraries called The Memoir of John Durang, and I'm a direct descendant, and he was an actor in Philadelphia in 17-something or other. Um, so at a, when I was young, they said to me, oh, I wonder if you'll be interested in architecture or theater. So they, you know, uh, that gave me a lot of freedom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, the thing about, uh, I, I know was, as a child and, and still sometimes in life, I can be very shy, so I would never, I did announce that I was going to write a play, and of course it was only two pages, but as I, I kept writing over the years, and each time, the next one was ten, and it took me a long time before I got up to full length, but, um, um, but my mother told my second grade teacher that I'd written a play, and I went to our Lady of Peace School, uh, obviously Catholic school. That particular year, I didn't have a nun. It was a, a lay person, it was such an odd phrase, but a, a, a male, man teacher. And uh, uh, who I didn't like for some reason. But in any case, he decided to have us put on the play. And they, we took off the afternoon, and I guess that my fellow second graders memorized it. Uh, it's short. Uh, and I sort of sat in a chair, being the director, and. Uh, uh, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was your first production. Um, later, uh, you attended Del Barton School in Morristown, New Jersey, and uh, apparently you and a friend wrote two musicals, Band in Boston and Business Fans Holiday. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about those early musicals and who was the collaborator? Well, oddly, I was just describing when I was watching my play in second grade and I was sitting in the chair as the author and so the director. This friend and I have no, the, who I wrote the shows with was a, a composer and musician who's still in the business named Kevin Farrell, 
and segregate with me. For some reason during this play, he sat next to me the whole time. I don't remember meeting him before, but he actually acted like he was the producer or something. <laughs> uh, but my mother's two sisters were musicians, uh, musicians, and they uh, were professional and been to Manhattan School of Music and stuff, but they, uh, they also then went into teaching. And uh, Kevin was my Aunt Phyllis's prize piano student, and he also loved musicals, so after a while we went to uh, musicals together. And uh, I don't know, when we were 12 and 13, we decided to write a show together, and uh, I did the book and lyrics, and he did the music, and uh, it was called Band in Boston. And again, I was too shy to tell. This school went from seventh grade to twelfth grade, taught by Benedictine monks who, uh, whatever my issues with Catholicism, they, they were terrific. I, I liked them a lot, and they were very smart. Um, but um, I was too shy to tell anyone in the school that we'd written this, but my mother, again, uh, for, my, for my 13th birthday, I was taken to see the movie of Gypsy, and my mother was greatly amused at the sign that said, Gypsy Rosalie's mother is not allowed backstage. And so she said, oh, I'm like Gypsy's mother because I keep going telling people about your writing. So she told the, uh, the priest who was head of the drama to, uh, you know, class or something, uh, club, I mean. And so they put it on when we were in eighth grade. But the thing that was very heavy about it was that it was performed by the juniors and seniors. And we were, you know, in the eighth grade. And, um, and we also, it was an all-place school, and we, uh, uh, we auditioned girls from a nearby Catholic school. And I, these were the first auditions I was a part of, and uh, I, I still remember them rather distinctly. And there was this one girl I found rather touching who I wanted to cast in the lead, but the director cast somebody who was probably better for the part. But, um, but the other thing that was funny about it was that I mentioned Gypsy, and... Um, uh, it, it was a very strange, uh, well, not a strange, it was a very, very innocent play. It was about uh, uh, Clara and her, her brother, I guess, Edmund, who I played, oh, I later played in another production, but um, <laughs> um, they lived with their, their maiden aunts who were very conservative. And by the way, I wasn't thinking about politics at all at the time, but they and a reverend decided that a local show that was going to be done was offensive for some reason. I don't know why I wrote about that. Um, um, so, in any case, they tried to shut this play down. And there, there, there's a section where you see the, the play, the musical that they want to shut down. It's not very shocking. A girl sings a song called I Love Mon I'm Monkey, I'm sorry, I Love Money. And, um, and at the end of it, she dropped her, her uh, shoulder strap, which I had seen. Natalie would do in the movie of Gypsy. I sound obsessed with Gypsy, but um, anyway, the priest thought it was great fun. It went really well, and it was exciting for me because some lines seemed to be funny that I didn't know were funny. But the nuns who loaned the girls were not pleased, and they announced that never again would they let Del Barton borrow girls from St. Elizabeth. Um, and. It was really very innocent. It ended with four marriages, very Shakespearean. Um, but the, the next one I wrote in 10th grade with Kevin, called Businessman's Holiday, and it, it, was, uh, it wasn't a copy of How to Succeed, but it was set in the world of uh, business. like, And um, so we borrowed girls now from the Oak Nose School, and, and um, the, the nuns, well, there wasn't any dropping of the shoulder strap, so then they were fine with that one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's talk about your time at the Yale School of Government. Actually, let's go back. Let's talk first. You went to Harvard for your <coughs> undergraduate degree. Yes. Yes, I did. Um, I, um, uh, I was a good student, but I, I left out. Del Barton was uh, from 7th grade to 12th grade. In eighth grade, my parents separated, and then they later divorced. And um, when they separated, they couldn't afford to send me to Del Barton anymore. So I left that school and went to another Catholic school that was just starting up. And it was taught by, well, I'm not going to say the, the kind of brothers who taught it, but uh, I hated them. And they were very stupid. Um, I'm sorry, they were. Um, 
and well, I, actually, I'll give the example I usually give is that Del Barton in eighth grade they had assigned uh, Gulliver's Travels and Candide, and in this school they uh, assigned Cheaper by the Dozen and God is My Co-Pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I like Cheaper by the Dozen, but I don't want to study in school. Um, so. Uh, uh, so oddly, I wrote this play with Kevin, and they put it on when I wasn't a student there. Um, but they somehow got me to, I don't, I don't remember how we did it, because it was a good half hour away. After school, at the one school, I'd be taken to the rehearsals from the other school. And, but I realized I had to leave the school, so I made it. It's actually one of the, I, I feel I've had some decision making that has been healthy in my life, and I realized I had to leave the school regardless. We had a very good public school where I lived, and, I, and I've been in summer school there, so I said to my mother, I either wanted to go to the public school, or I wanted to apply to uh, uh, North Carolina School of the Arts, which had just opened. And my uncle came and told me I couldn't go there because Elia Kazan was a communist. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother didn't want me to go away to school, so we agreed to that I would go to the public school, when all of a sudden the other school Del Barton showed up and gave me a scholarship, and I was thrilled. Uh, but I did have to <laughs> get all A's to keep this up. I, I was a good student, but I, I wasn't great at math, and so I had to get all A's, and I did. And I probably worked the hardest in those two years than I did at all. But that actually isn't why I got into Harvard. I never would have applied, but uh, this oddly worldly school of Del Barton, the um, the same teacher who, who my mother told me about the eighth grade play was a college guidance counselor, and he didn't recommend one Catholic school to me. And I don't think he was looking ahead at Sister Mary either, but um, uh, he suggested all these very fancy schools. And I said, well, I know my grades have been good in junior and, and were still in senior, but I didn't have that good grades in uh, uh, freshman and sophomore at the other school. And I don't know if this is still true, but he said, oh, you know what, the, the schools really want to find individuals. They don't want just somebody who's all-rounded. I know this was just a quirk of the times. But, uh, so he said, you've written plays and it's unusual, and so you should push that in your applications and so on. And I applied to all these schools except Harvard, except my mother's divorce lawyer. She was in the process of getting the divorce. Said, oh, why didn't you apply to Harvard? Because he went to Harvard. So, because of my mother's divorce lawyer, I applied, <laughs> and I am, I did not expect to get in. I thought Yale had more theater stuff, so, and I applied to some excellent Quaker schools like Swarthmore and uh, uh, Haverford. But when I got into Harvard, I, I was so surprised that I just thought, well, I guess I'll go there. I, I knew they didn't have a theater uh, major, but I thought since I wanted to be a writer that maybe being back, uh, well-rounded would be a good idea. However, I then went into a deep depression, very serious depression, uh, end of freshman year till really the, the summer after uh, junior year. It was a very difficult time. And I would have probably gone through it anywhere. It wasn't Harvard's fault at all. Uh, but that leads me to the question you almost asked. By the time I applied and again was surprised to get into Yale School of Drama, I was feel, uh, mostly through this rather bad depression, and I had not been doing that much theater, so the idea of going to Yale and being surrounded by these talented people and working on theater, what felt like 24 hours, was fabulous. I loved it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you, you just mentioned this to me back there, that uh, while you were at Harvard, you wrote the greatest musical ever sung, and Al Franken was in it. Yes, he was. Uh, he was he's two years younger than me, I think. Um, uh, at Harvard, I assumed I was going to keep writing, and I didn't. And um, I was just in this crazy depression. And uh, in the summer, I'd been in a production of Andy Get Your Gun and a rehearsal long time. Oh, I don't want to tell the story too long. The greatest musical ever sung, I'd been writing just to amuse myself. It was a little bit like Things Mad Magazine did, where they took famous songs and did funny lyrics. And I decided. And again, I was still a believing Catholic at the time, so it wasn't uh, sacrilegious or anything. I just thought it would be amusing to tell the Gospels in musical comedy terms, as if it was a musical. And um, so in my version, um, the songs include Everything's Coming Up Moses, <laughs> The Dove That Done Me Wrong, The Mother Sings. And, um, 
And I used to um, uh, sing some of these songs to people at dinner at, 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 at the house I lived in at Harvard, which was Dunster House. And um, someone, it's very odd, because uh, I was shy and also I, I thought the thing was funny, but I didn't, I, I, I felt shy at Harvard. Somebody went to the Dunster House drama thing and said, oh, you should get Chris Duran to put this play on. Um, and they came to me and offered it to me. Uh, I, well, you know, in the world of the little house you're living in. I mean, it was, a, it, it, it was three, 300 people, and Al, Al Gore was there, but I didn't know it. And so it was uh, Tommy Lee Jones, and I did know it because I'd seen him on stage. Anyway, so my putting it on was actually a big mental step forward because I almost said no because I thought, what if I become depressed and non-functional and I can't show up as the director and blah, 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 blah. And then I thought, uh, no, go ahead and do it. So uh, it, it was great fun. Uh, I auditioned various people. In my version, we couldn't get 12 apostles. We had about nine and, and, and about five of them were women. Uh, my uh, freshman year roommate, though, made a great uh, Jesus because he really looked like, very handsome and he looked sort of like a more strapping James Taylor. And uh, anyway, it was a lot of fun to do, but weirdly, it created a bit of uh, controversy. Um, it only ran for two weekends, and it got a good review in the uh, Harvard newspaper. But then, as as the weeks went on, it started to be there started to be some letters saying this play was offensive to Catholics, and this is this is in 1970, so it's a little surprising because uh, the sort of culture wars were not as pronounced at that point. Um, and then uh, I remember an English professor wrote back and said, are you crazy? Haven't you heard of satire? Blah, 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 blah. That made me feel good. But then there were more letters. And then the fine, final one was that uh, uh, there was a teaching fellow. And a lot, the teaching fellows did a lot of the, if you had a big lecture class, you often had small sections taught by teaching fellows. And then there was one who was apparently a Jesuit priest. And he wrote a, a thing saying that my play had been very offensive and that the critic who liked it was offensive. And he then said that, the critic and Durang are pigs trampling in a sanctuary. You know, it's surprising to read these things about yourself. But what's, what, what I felt both naughty about, but I, I, I included that in my Yale application. <laughs> so anyway, um, but, it, but it was a very healthy thing for me to do. It was a lot of fun. Oh, and I, I found Al Franken in a in an audition. He's very good. Well, that leads us to Yale. Um, you were there during the Bruce Dean years, and uh, I believe Howard Stein was the head of the playwriting program, very supportive of your work at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you, during that time, you and Albert uh, Inorato co-wrote The Idiots, Karmazov, I Don't Normally Like Poetry, But Have You Read Trees, and Jip, The Real Life Story of Mitzi Gaynor, in which you played Mitzi Gaynor. <laughs> okay. So how did that collaboration work? Uh, according to Albert, you almost got kicked out of school twice. Where did you hear that? It was on the, on the tribute tape. <sighs> yes, Albert thinks we were almost kicked out. We weren't. I don't know why he thinks that. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, and, and just so you know, uh, I also ended up collaborating with Wendy Wasserstein, who came a little bit later, and, and, and later collaborated with Sigourney, who was in Albert in my year uh, for uh, but she was in a whole bunch of my plays, and we were in plays together, so that was fun. Albert and I were in the same playwriting class, and he came from uh, Philadelphia and a Catholic background, and I came from New Jersey and a Catholic background. And we both looked at each other with suspicion, like, is there enough room for two writers who bring up nuns a lot? <laughs> and um, and we, we sort of looked, trying to figure out if we were going to hate each other or not, and then... Um, he, he's a very witty and funny fellow, and he said something, he, he would say things and then I would laugh. And then, of course, people always like you when you laugh at what they say. So we started, indeed, to be friends. And uh, among other things I often say, just uh, getting to know him, uh, it seems like the Italian nuns who uh, he was brought up with were very violent. And he told <laughs> one child who she put between her legs and you know what, like that. <laughs> That, that didn't happen in my school. So, uh, um, but I, I always felt that I came from Irish repressive nuns. Um, and I, I think I did. Uh, 
Um, so, but, so anyway, we got to be friends. And um, uh, the Yale Cabaret was the, the best place to get a show on. It couldn't be longer than an hour, but, uh, and it needed to be, well, anyway. It, it, of course, it was better if it was a comedy or something with music, but occasionally they put on a serious play, but not that often. But it was a different show every single week. So um, Albert Knight uh, ended up doing this very odd cabaret called I Don't Generally Like Poetry, But V Ray Trees, where it, 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 we were asked to do something for the Yale Art Gallery. This is where he thinks we almost got kicked out. The Yale Art Gallery was horrified by what we did. But Howard Stein, being a playwright, thought it was fabulous. And then they put us in the cabaret. Um, it, they, they were doing uh, something about William Blake, the poet, and also the poet and artist Thomas Gray. And they had uh, done paintings of each other's poems or something like that at the beginning. But they asked us, they asked somebody from the drama school to come and do an event of 40 minutes uh, about Thomas Blake and, I'm sorry, William Blake and Thomas Gray. And Albert and I, and Howard Stein asked us to do it, knowing that we were, we were kind of crackpot in our, our comedy. And so Albert and I didn't think for a second of being serious. And so we came out initially doing a serious poetry reading. And Albert is much larger than I am and a big, boisterous voice. And he was very over the top. And, and we didn't, we read a couple of poems badly. And then, uh, we said, uh, or we had a woman working with us too, Barbara Howden, and we said, um, maybe she said, uh, Thomas Gray and William Blake met each other in a touring company of the Glass Menagerie. <laughs> at, at which point, Albert and I had exited, and we never dressed as women, instead we dressed as priests. So Albert played Amanda, but he was dressed in a, in a white high mass outfit, and I played Laura, dressed in a black uh, monk's robe that I got from Del Barton, actually, uh, <laughs> when I made a, a, a short movie of the Brothers Karamazov, before, anyway. So, anyway, uh, then later on we appeared again dressed as priests, but this time we were Eleanor Roosevelt and Franklin Bell and Roosevelt in Sunrise of Campobello. And at one point, after we did that, all of a sudden, Franklin said, come, let's say mass. And then we sang something about, oh, we took the words of Veal Common and turned it into mass. And um, after we finished that number, someone stood up in the audience and said, I don't know about you, but I find that offensive. Come, Edith. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so if the Yale Art Gallery had had the power to throw us out, I think they would have. But instead, Howard Stein called up the El Cabaret and said, oh, it's hilarious, you should put it on. So, and actually, we, we played for two weekends. Oh, and this is the weirdest thing to tell. It's so obscure. Uh, usually, the play just, the, the Yet Cabaret only did one weekend, but we did really well, and they decided to give a second weekend. So, they wanted somebody to write a review of it for the, the local graduate newspaper that people looked at when they went in the Cabaret. And, um, the person writing the cabaret said, uh, there isn't anybody who saw it. Would you write a review under a pseudonym and, and we'll get it printed? And so I came across it recently in an old box. And I didn't give us a raid. That's what she said. <laughs> I, I hope that I made it seem funny. But it, that last line was something like um, that, that the entire evening was definitely of interest, if funny. <laughs> it made more sense in the context, but in any case, uh, then um, to jump ahead, I can't remember if it was the same year or the next year, I think it was the same year, we decided to try to do it again, and we did the life story of Mitzi Gaynor, I don't know why, uh, I didn't dress as a, a woman, um, I, I just was myself as Mitzi Gaynor, and Albert, we came up with the crazy thing that uh, Mitzi Gaynor's mother was horrifying, and Albert played her. And at some point, we also turned into Gloria Steinem, who I was, and Bella Abdul, not Abdul, Bella Abdul, <laughs> who Albert was, with the floppy hat. Anyway, and then they, the, um, the Brothers Karamazov, or the Idiots Karamazov, was in a full-length play that Albert and I wrote, and I wrote the lyrics, and we found a composer. And it was done, Albert got a job directing at an undergraduate 
drama thing. So it was outside the drama school. But again, Howard Stein came to it and liked it, and, and it got moved to the, uh, to the uh, second year actors project, which in the world of Yale was a big deal. And that was the class that had Meryl Streep in it. And Meryl played the lead. You wouldn't recognize her in any of the pictures. It's very disappointing when I show the pictures, because she played an 80-year-old woman. She looked like a wicked witch in a wheelchair, but she was brilliant in it, uh, very, very funny. And um, that was a very, uh, that was a good experience, except the acting teacher, very difficult man, but uh, someone knows him. Um, uh, we went, Albert and I went back to rehearsal and he had cut every single laugh line, every single one, because he wanted it to be darker. And so Albert and I, just the students, had to have a meeting and we said, I'm sorry, our names are on it, not yours. And he thought we were impossible, but he did put it back. So it just shows you, you have to stand up for yourself a lot. Um, but, uh, and then I'll shut up about Yale, but uh, it was, I did feel that Albert and I won the lottery. Uh, in the history of Yale, uh, Yale Repertory Theater was the professional theater. Brucey hardly ever, ever chose a theater, a, a, a playwright project to be there. But he chose this one, and Meryl was still the lead because she's now the third and final year, and they got to work at the rep. And I got my equity card by being playing the monk Alyosha, who I played also in the little film I made before. Um, and that was very exciting, although when it was over, I had no money. But other than that, <laughs> it was very exciting. Speaking of having no money, mm -hmm. um, so you, when you went to New York uh, in the early years, um, you were doing showcases, uh, or your group were doing showcases. You did, uh, but you had an early success with Das Lusitania Songspiel, <laughs> which you performed with uh, your fellow uh, Yale alumna, Sigourney Weaver. Now, John, this is, I love this quote from John Kander. He once said that at the end of the performance of that show, he was laughing and applauding so loudly that he hit the lady next to him. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that quote. Yeah. Uh, how did that evolve and how did it, did it change things for you? I know it was quite successful. Um, I'm going to jump back slightly. Sure. Because I, I just, it's so hard to make a living. Um, and I've been really lucky. But what happened, when, when I finished my acting job, I didn't have anything. I didn't have much money in the bank. So I had to find different jobs, and I stayed an extra year in, in, at Yale, even though it wasn't there, because uh, I already had an apartment, it wasn't that expensive, and I was getting to be friends with Wendy Wasserstein, so I hung around with her a lot. Uh, but I worked uh, as an acting teacher, even though I'd never had an acting class. Um, but uh, but that, they weren't going to go into a profession anyway, so it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but my favorite job was that I found uh, I, I got a typing job, I'm a good typist, at the Yale Medical School, and my job was to write the, to send out letters to people who had donated, who said they were donating their bodies to Yale after death, to write and say that Yale had a glut of bodies, and you had to make alternative plans. And, 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 and I also spent some time going through the files, which I wasn't supposed to, because some of the people's stories were very peculiar. But anyway, um, and I was trying to get Brustein to do a history of the American film, and he was, uh, which I'd been writing, and he was very tempted. But then he chose a play by Yale Doctorow, famous author, and uh, so just as I was not sure what to do next, he did though give me a grant. Uh, which was $8,000 from CBS Playwriting uh, Prize. And with that money, I braved going to New York because I was a little phobic about New York, even though I loved going in. I always found it too intense. Uh, I mean, I loved going in to see shows when I was young, but uh, blah, blah, blah. So, I, I, and back then, one could live on $8,000. I don't know if you could now. I don't know. But uh, nonetheless, I was very, very lucky. And so it was during that period that I had a couple of... Uh, workshops in the city. <clears throat> and um, one of them was a play called Titanic, which had been done at Yale, and uh, Sigourney, and Sigourney was in it. Uh, she'd just come to New York, too. And uh, we, because Idiot's Karamazov had gotten a, re a good review from the New York Times, bad local reviews, but a good Times one, 
Um, and the early show of the uh, power of the times. Anyway, um, uh, Titanic then moved off Broadway. And we, but it was only an hour and ten minutes, and we needed a curtain raiser. So Sigourney and I had been talking about doing an act together because we had uh, been in a singing class together, and we had had to do a show, and we did a number together that had gone well. So uh, we decided, because the play was called Titanic, we decided to, what's another ship that sank? And we thought of Lusitania. And they'd always done Brecht and Vile up at Yale, often very, very well, and I love Brecht and Vile. But we did this Brecht and Vile parody called Das Lusitania Songspiel. <laughs> and um, it was done as a curtain raiser. And then um, the, the play ti ti Titanic got ghastly reviews. It got medium good off-off, but off-order it was awful. And uh, mostly they didn't like Das Lusitania, but, but they sort of dismissed it, except for Edith Oliver in the New Yorker who liked it, so that cheered me up. But then um, a couple of years later, I had History of American Film, and it did go to Broadway, and that was thrilling, but then it closed fast, and then I had a writer's block, and then I didn't, didn't have money again. And uh, then I wrote Sister Mary Ignatius, and Sister Mary Ignatius was happening at the same time that our second version of Das Lusitania was happening, and it was the second version that was a big success. Um, uh, the play Vanities was, was off Broadway, and the producers offered Sigourney and me an 11 p.m. Shot, uh, slot for free, and we each got $5 per, per, per performance, that was all. And uh, we decided to update this, make it an hour, write it a little more carefully. She co-wrote it with me, and it's just the two of us. And we pretended to be experts on vile and, and uh, correct, but had all our facts wrong purposely and so forth. And um, it, it was a very uh, exciting thing because it became a cult thing. I, I, we had a parody of Stephen Sondheim where we said that Brecht had written a play called <clears throat> Ava Perone, the Demon First Lady of Buenos Aires. <laughs> and it combined Sweeney Todd and Davida, and one night Sondheim came and apparently was laughing and was starting to thrill with that. Um, and at the same time, Sister Mary Ignatius, which only ran for three weeks at Ensemble Studio, got great reviews. So my money situation didn't change, but suddenly um, it was very in encouraging. <laughs> Um, we hit that point that we were talking oh, about. Oh, right. Um, but, uh, so let's just talk brief. I mean, we could talk all night about, uh, you know, wonderful stories uh, to tell. But just in terms of what's going on in the business today, we, we had talked briefly about <laughs> development versus production and how the paradigm has changed since those days, even. Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Yes. Well, I'm not... Uh you know, I'm not always a great analyst of what's wrong today and all that kind of stuff, but I, I've been teaching at Juilliard with, uh, co-teaching with Marcia Norman, who will be here later uh, uh, tomorrow, the next day, and uh, we've been doing it since 1994, and it's been a wonderful part of my life. Uh, we, uh, it's, a, it's not a degree program, we only meet every Wednesday and then two, two Tuesdays a month where the Juilliard actors read things. But I have a whole slew now of young playwrights, uh, some of them you know, no longer as young, but, um, and knowing of some of their experiences, and uh, one of the things that does seem very troublesome, and I don't quite know how to, what to do about it, but uh, when, when I was coming out of Yale, which is like 75, 76, it seemed like there was a lot of money for productions of new American plays, and now there seems like way less money, but also it's geared toward workshops. And that's very hard on the new, on the young, or not even young, just still trying to establish themselves as playwrights, because it, it makes for less opportunity. Also, uh, you know, if you've never had a production of anything and you get a workshop, that's great. But I just mean if that's all the theaters are offering to them. And then something else that happens with my students, and again, it's not, not anything I went through. Uh, like, if the theater did a, a reading of mine, they did a reading of mine, and we'd see how it went. But uh, my, lately, it seems like if there's interest in a writer, five different theaters offer them readings. They have readings at all five theaters. Dramaturgs come, and each one gives a different interpretation of what you should do to quote, quote, fix your play. And um, authors can lose their play that way, as well as not uh, be getting a production. 
And you have to be, uh, I, you know, and it's odd trying to figure out how, because it's not like you never want to listen to something people say, but um, you have to, just to give you a, something that was indelible in my brain, when, before Sister Mary Ignatius was done, and it, it's a one act of like an hour and ten minutes, my agent sent it to a few places, and uh, one of them, it was in Rochester or something like that, the dramaturg wrote back and said, well, Chris is definitely talented, but we all know you can't open a play with a 30-minute monologue. <laughs> there aren't rules. There really aren't rules. And plus, also, how can you say that after Beckett wrote Happy Days, which is almost all monologue, not to mention other things. So I, I, maybe because of the encouragement of my parents, I didn't believe that dramaturg for one second, not for one. Uh, but I, I know different personalities would go, Oh, I see. Oh, you know, I guess the audience can't stand it. Anyway, I don't quite know how to protect yourself from that, although I do think maybe one way to do it, and I think I did this unconsciously, is if you see uh, uh, plays and, and movies that you love, uh, say, I love this, and then try to, th try to think what it is that play does, and if you do something similar, and then they say, well, that can't ever be done, just just trust yourself a bit. Now, I'm not saying never listen to anybody, and I've also had some good experiences with dramaturgs. Although, when I was describing it to Garrett before we came out, I, I well, I mentioned two that I think are very good, Morgan Janess and uh, Janice Perrin. I work with them at the public and at the uh, uh, McCarter Theater. But I felt that both of them were trying to give me feedback to help me write the play I wanted to write, and not trying to change my play into something that they thought would be better. Even if the play you write isn't so good, I think it should be the play you want to write. Um, good. Which leads us uh, to something we were talking about earlier that interests me a great deal. Um, and it's how you deal with your students at Juilliard and helping them find their voice as a writer. Um, you had this wonderful uh, uh, phrase that you said, you and Marcia have them write uh, from their own stuff. Um, so talk a little bit about that and the, the challenges for young writers in that. Well, the, um, to, to be fair, uh, uh, our third year of teaching, one of our students was uh, Jessica Goldberg, a very talented writer. And uh, she at some point said that um, a lot of the writers in the room, the best plays seemed to come when you were writing from your stuff meaning the stuff that you know about the world yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the weird dysfunction in my family, there was a lot of imposing will on one another. When, you know, Sister Mary imposes her will on things. And um, um, anyway, uh, we started to remind our students about that, you know, because sometimes if you, uh, are writing a play either because you think, oh, this might be commercial, or you're trying to please somebody, that, you know, what ended up being successful about Sister Mary Ignatius was that I wrote from some feeling I was having. I had no idea it would be successful, none at all. And one story I often tell is that I, I, History of American Film, I thought that was going to be successful. It did get to Broadway, but it only ran a little while. And then I went from being very hot to being cold, in, you know, in the playwright world. And I, and I went into a, uh, depression, and I remember saying to my agent, Helen Merrill, you know, I, I'm, I'm just having trouble writing. How long can I be without putting something out before people will forget me? And she said, two years. <laughs> <laughs> and since I was only about six months into it, I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> I like the clarity of it. Um, but, um, and my mother was also ill and dying of cancer during it, which is another reason why it was hard. And, um, uh, sometime when she was still ill, I had, had this impulse to write a play about this woman, uh, a nun, who comes out and explains everything in the world. So explains it all for you was a big part of it. Because looking back, I, I, I had stopped believing in the Catholic teaching I'd been taught, but not with venom. I just sort of, it didn't work for me anymore. So when I looked back on all the things we've been told sent you to hell, you know, like uh, eating meat on Friday, um, uh, when, when I was little, it struck me as really peculiar. So I was writing from that, and anyway, I then put it aside, and after my mother died, I was on a train to Washington, actually, as I was today, and I was, I, I was writing, writing the rest of the play, and I thought, oh my God, it's finishing too soon. It's, it's going to be a one-act, like Titanic. 
And I thought, oh, he can't make any money with the one act. And I thought, I should just put this aside and come up with a, a commercial, full-length play. And I only thought that for about 10 minutes, because then I thought, psychologically, that is so unhealthy. You've been in a two-year writing block. Whatever this is, you must finish it. So I finished it, and uh, the success of that play ultimately, well, I mean, I, it, it bumped my career from here to here. It really did. Didn't happen immediately with, with great reviews for the three-week produ uh, three production. Then some people tried to produce it off Broadway and couldn't. Then when I wrote a companion piece for a theatrical nightmare, so it could be double cast, Andre Bishop at uh, Playwrights Horizons decided to present it again. And I thought, oh God, will the critics like it the same way? And they did. Which was really good. But in, in any case, um, it, it also just shows it's, it's tricky. Another thing, because I, I do sometimes say this to my students, that I thought History of the American Film was going to be what would quote, quote, have me move forward. And it's important not to hold on to just one play. Be prolific. <laughs> um, because you never know what one will help you get forward or will get a produ production and so forth. Right. Um, shall we take some questions? Yes. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was uh, recently reading Sister Mary, and uh, there were some certain parts of it that I stopped and I thought to myself, wow, somebody walked out then. <laughs> I would go to another page and I thought, yeah, I bet they got up and walked out then. And uh, my question to you was, did it bother you or did it enter your mind that, 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 that you should go, you know, hold back or think maybe this is too much and take it out? Or did you pretty much let it go? Well, um, you know, it's a strange thing. I find myself more mad at the Catholic Church now than I, I don't, I wasn't mad when I wrote the play. I understand, I guess it comes off as mad. I was mad about the dogma, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't mistreated by nuns, actually. I didn't have any really bad nuns. Uh, I just didn't like the mind games. Uh, it, it, me, they're not games, they're sincerely meant, but, but you know, uh, babies who die and aren't baptized have to go to limbo because God is such a bureaucrat, he won't accept them with a bad baptism. I mean, what kind of nonsense is that? My mother also had three stillbirths, so, uh, you know, uh, I think she got them all baptized, but I mean, it, it's stupid. Um, but when I wrote the play, I honestly thought everyone would agree with me. Because I wasn't actually, I wasn't, I wasn't saying God didn't exist. I wasn't saying that Jesus wasn't God. I was just saying, gee, these rules don't make sense to me. And I took some, like, limbo and, and eating meat on Friday. And then a lot about sexuality, because the Catholic Church basically says... Everyone should be celibate or married, and if you have sex, you must be open to having a baby. So no bad. Where is that in the Bible? <laughs> um, so, um, you know, and I also had no idea that audiences would find the play funny. Uh, she would, you know, Walter Kerr, who didn't like my plays in general, but he gave a moderately, and he was Catholic, he gave a moderately good review to Sister Mary, and he said, to get Duran credit, he actually says the dogma correctly. Uh, but it was odd that, uh, you know, it made... But yes, uh, it came as a big surprise to me. And I'll tell you, the one place I would change it, uh, and it sounds like you found more, but... Um, <laughs> uh, but um, when I decided the students were coming back, i uh, grown up, and I thought it was an interesting idea that the sister had already talked about the her favorite student had written this pageant that they all did. And I thought, okay, adults doing something that a children wrote may come out, may come out funny. And so, uh, and I also wanted to sort of remind people of what the, the teachings of, of that Christianity was about virgin birth and all that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, so with the conceit that the children have written this years ago, but the adults are now doing it, uh, Jesus is nailed to the cross, and Jesus is played by a little doll, which I think children might have done. But when adults put a little doll with a surfer blonde haircut on the, on the crucifix, it looks crazy. <laughs> and, um, and the original Sister Mary, who was so brilliant, Elizabeth Franz, she, she helped that moment by just looking at it so disturbed. She knew something bothered her, but she couldn't quite place it. And that, 
I love that. But a lot of actresses didn't do that. And uh, it's before I, as an author, chip, looked at all my stage directions when the printed thing is, it says he's nailed to the cross. In our version, we uh, ended up uh, doing it with Velcro and just doing a fake uh, uh, hammer on the ground. But when you actually put nails into the doll, ooh, it creeps the audience out. And then furthermore, there are some people who just are very disturbed and put out. So they really leave there. And, and it felt like they were audiences who hadn't totally checked out yet. So, uh, you know, I would uh, change that somehow, maybe not do the, the cross thing. Uh, but I, I actually wouldn't change anything else. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, right back there. Yes? What's been the most challenging project since then, and why? Gee, you know, I don't know that I have, I have one answer. Um, sex and Longing was the most painful thing, because I, 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 it, it was so badly received. I haven't read the reviews, actually, but I, I got how much it was hated. And uh, I do think, what I think about it is, I think that I wrote a three-act play thinking it was an ep could be an epic, and I think the first two acts are good. I think the third act isn't good, and I, um, and so that was sort of painful. The actors were quite wonderful, but um, so that that was painful. I, I, but I don't know quite what else to say. That was more painful than difficult. It's difficult because I couldn't fix it. Um, sure, the one here. Um, if Howard Stein hadn't been so supportive of you along the way, do you think you would have continued on as a playwright? Uh, in, in case you didn't hear, he was asking if uh, Howard Stein hadn't been. Uh, supportive, do you think I would correct, uh, continue as a playwright? I really agree and value that question because when uh, I went into such a, a self-doubting period at Harvard, I just thought maybe I wasn't meant to be a writer at all. I kept applying to these expository writing classes that take 200 people I could never get in, uh, and I just thought I mustn't be very good. And then, um, partially through helpful therapists just making me feel better, I started to write again, and um, I, I, it was odd because I, I definitely wrote differently after that three years. I, I was a little more mature and I was darker. And I wrote two plays right away. The second one was The Nature and Purpose of the Universe, and I, I uh, sent that into Yale School of Drama. And it's interesting, I went to this one English professor who liked me but had almost had to flunk me because I kept not getting the papers, but then finally I did. Um, <laughs> And I asked him if he would write me a recommendation, and he said, oh, yes, I would. And he said, gee, that's awfully hard to get into. But I knew that they were basing it on the play and not on your grades, so, because uh, I couldn't have gotten in on grades. Um, uh, and I also like to tell people that I didn't get into Brandeis playwriting at the same time I did get into Yale School Drama. So, you know, it's just it's so much. And also, it wasn't just Howard Stein who chose them, the other major person was Richard Gilman, the critic and teacher, and um, um, uh, as I got to know Mr. Gilman better, he was very quirky individual with his choices, so I, I just feel I was very lucky and I, that I got chosen, but uh, I could just as easily not have been, but I, I didn't feel brave enough to go to New York on my own, and it still felt like going to New York was what you were supposed to do. And I did go to Yale thinking, I, I'm going to see if I get encouragement or not. So I do think the fact that the teachers were encouraging was, was very significant. Yeah. I think teachers are wonderful, by the way. With all this terrible stuff going on in the media, they're great. Back there. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, I hear a lot of you saying, um, I was thinking about this and I decided I have to finish this. <laughs> or, you know, I was doing this and you know, I ended up doing it, or, you know, whatever it was. And I just wonder if there's something that you say to yourself that I need this structure or some sort of uh, schedule that you give to yourself to say, these are the ones I need to finish, or this is what I just need to, like, oh, the, uh, the gentleman's saying, change this with Sister Mary, or uh -huh. if you ever go back and say, this is enough, or there's some sort of schedule to it. Um. Is that clear? I, I'm not sure about the rewriting part, but let me try to answer what I think I did understand about schedule, maybe, and, and deciding something. Um, because I had a, 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 well, I had a couple of writer's block. 
my college years and then after Sister American Film. So after I wrote Sister Mary Ignatius and I got a commission from the Phoenix Theater, it was very small money, but it was for a production though, not a workshop, to write a play and I said I was going to write something about therapy. But because I had this writer's block, I got worried about myself and so I, I, I like to write intuitively and spur of the moment and in the mood and that's mostly how I've written. But when I was younger and having those writer's blocks. So with Beyond Therapy, I did put myself on a schedule. I, I, my rule, it's hard to give yourself rules, but I said it has to be, you have to do it five days a week, at least two to three hours. That sounds short to people, but I can't write for five hours in two to three hours. Uh, and the most important thing is I couldn't stop if I didn't like what I was doing. I had to keep, but that was the hardest part because, and I see this with my students too, when you're either being perfectionist or disliking something. And so, um, some days I would feel very depressed because I think, oh, all right, I stuck to it, but I think it's awful. But in the next day, when I looked at it, I, there two things happened. Either I would go in a different mood and go, oh, this isn't as bad as I thought. And then the other thing I would feel with a fresher brain, I'd go, oh, well, this is good. But then it goes off here, and I don't have to go there. Well, let's not send them to Nebraska. Let's send them to Wisconsin. Um, so, uh, and then the latest thing I've done, because now that I'm older, it's more the busyness of life and laziness that keeps me from writing. I'm not as driven to write as I was younger, although I still, still want to keep going. But I found that if I've written Act One and been feeling stuck, this happened summer vacation I had. And by the way, Marsha and I bring our, uh, our work into class, uh, and so we get feedback too. And I brought Act One in, and Marsha and a playwright named Daniel Goldfarb, who just uh, had a very nice play at Manhattan Theatre Club, but he was a student at the time, really gave me some lovely feedback about Betty's summer vacation. And uh, it stuck with me, and, and somebody offered me a reading of it, and I said, well, I only have Act One, and they said, it was a, a month and a half away, he said, well, you can either just have a reading of Act 1, or if you have the whole play, we'll read that. So I, once I get thinking about actors, I get excited. So I started thinking about casting it, and basically I wrote the Act 2 for this reading. And I did that again with Why Torture is Wrong, and I just did it again with a new play that I'm having read at McCarter this Monday. So that's my new trick, <laughs> which is to, to get a, a reading schedule. And, and the... No. <laughs> Can you just share with them the, the genesis of Betty Summer Vacation and what you originally intended to do in setting up to write that play? Well, after the bad uh, critical response to Sex and Longing, which was dark and very sexual in some times, anyway, um, I thought Beyond Therapy is one of my best, most produced plays, and it is one of my friendliest ones, even though the therapists are crazy and the male therapists in particular, but in any case, um, the audience goes home feeling happy usually. So I thought, I want to write another play like that, also hoping that it will sell. And so, uh, uh, both with my parents and then later with my mother when she was divorced and her girlfriends, we, we used to go to the New Jersey shore for like two weeks vacation and they're mostly very happy memories. So I decided I was going to write about the New Jersey shore and then I decided I was going to do something like put the characters like they were all from Baywatch and make them all be young people in bathing suits and they're going to do that with self tickets too. <laughs> and, um, so my idea was to write something sort of fond and, and playful. And what I, again, I write intuitively and so Trudy and Betty come and they're talking about that and then they don't know who the people are who are coming to stay with them and Keith comes in and he's a serial killer. And I didn't say he's going to be a serial killer. I seem to when I'm in a good mood, write improvisationally. So sometimes the people say things that I don't know are there. So obviously a, a play with a serial killer probably is not going to be like Beyond Therapy. So um, uh, anyway, I did end up enjoying writing that play, but it, I, I've yet to write as friendly a play as uh, Beyond Therapy. Yes, back there. You mentioned a little bit about your experience with depression. I was wondering if that in any way might have informed the writing of Laughing Wild. It seemed like somewhat of a critique of self-help culture. <laughs> no, 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 that's a good question. Uh, did you all hear it? Okay. Oh, uh, asking about depression. 
and wondering if, if that had affected the writing of Laughing Wild, and which also seemed like a bit of a send-up of self-help stuff. I had giggled because, um, <laughs> well, Beyond Therapy made some people assume that uh, I didn't like therapy. I actually think therapy is really valuable, and I've had some very valuable ones. I've had a couple that were not great, but, uh, and I had one friend who had, wasn't seduced by her therapist, but they had a bad relationship. I mean, they were unfriendly with one another in a weird way. Um, but, <laughs> I know it sounds mysterious, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but therapy, particularly, uh, I, it was for free at Harvard, and it was really a lifesaver. I lucked out with somebody who really, it's funny, he was a, a therapist in, in training. I was probably 24, and he was probably 29, but he was so helpful to me, really helpful. Um, and, um, but, you know, once I sort of got out in the world and, uh, well, I, you know, I found it depressing not to believe what I was taught as a Catholic child. So that was part of my depression, I think. And, um, and then, uh, I don't know, somewhere in my late 30s, I, I started renting a house in Connecticut. And <laughs> I had a lot of friends who were in sort of new age kind of things. Or to, uh, is why I giggled. Because I actually found a lot of those comforting. At the same time, I do make fun of them in, um, in, in Laughing Wild, although I guess inwardly I don't totally make fun of them. For instance, affirmations, you, you know, just oh, everything is fine in my life, blah, 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 blah. I, I do find it calming, but then the other thing is that there is that thing called cognitive therapy, which is actually a, a science and not new age, and it is about changing your thoughts, and that if you keep thinking, I'm worthless, I'm worthless, I'm worthless, you're not going to get better. <laughs> well, if you, you know, if you say, I, I am worthwhile. I, I mean, I've actually told this to my students, the ones who are too perfectionist. And also, I, you know, don't, don't try to write a perfect play anyway. Try to really write a good one. But I, I will say that um, Laughing Wild, I, what preceded it was my play, The Marriage of Bette and Boo, which was rather unabashedly about my parents' marriage and the surrounding families. Although, there were at least five more alcoholics I didn't write about. Because <laughs> uh, it seemed like bad writing. It seemed overwritten. Um, but it was the last time I specifically wrote about my family. And Laughing Wild was the first one where really the parents are not talked about. It was more like people my age and what they're doing to survive. I was also finding New York kind of in intensive at that time. There, and also, they, they released a lot of mental patients thanks to Reagan. In New York. 